Okay, here's on. We'll get. So yeah, we're recording right now. So just FYI, let's go ahead and shut that door and let's get um, Anthony in here. Yeah. It's just us and Kira right now. Hello, everybody. Give us just a minute to get going. I'm gonna pause the recording for just a moment while we get situated. Okay, so we're now recording. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, my name is Kara Barron, and I'm the Science and Outreach Manager here at Gila Watershed Partnership. And I am pleased to share with you um, our interns, the BLM interns. Um, today, um, they're going to present, be presenting what they've, some of the things that they've learned while they've been with us over the last few months. So um, we have Trent Rodriguez with us, and Anthony Hopkins Jr., and Emily East. And they're each going to give their presentation um, shortly. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we have the subscription to Zoom that only allows us 40 minutes. So keep that in mind. If you have any questions for the presenters, I'm going to ask that you put them in the chat so that we can answer them at the end. They're going to give their presentations one after the other, and then we'll have them sit as a panel at the end. Um, and just a reminder again that um, this is being recorded. So with no further ado, I'm going to introduce Trent Rodriguez, and I'm going to share the screen here real quick, and we'll let him get started. Okay, take it away, Trent. Hi, everyone. I'm Trent. Um, a little bit about who I am. Um, I'm originally from Miami, Florida. Um, I moved to Tucson to study at the University of Arizona, and I graduated last May with a BS in environmental science, as well as a certificate in international environmental conservation. Um, for the past four months, I've been an intern here at Gila Watershed Partnership. Um, I am interested in the future in continuing restoration work, maybe outside of the Southwest, um, and so, in this presentation, I'll be talking broadly about restoration as a concept. Um, so, what is, what is restoration? What does it mean? Um, the word restore implies that you're putting a place to a previous state. Uh, so, are we trying to restore an area to pristine nature? Uh, most places have been modified in the past for thousands of years, and so that's a little bit of a tricky question. Uh, the official definition, I guess, from SER, the Society for Ecological Restoration, defines it as the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. Um, and so, to me, I think that means uh, restoring a degraded area into a healthier state. Uh, I'm going to be talking in this presentation about a project that the BLM and GWP are working on together, which is uh, the Rabbit Farm Restoration Site. And so first, let me talk a little bit about um, the Gila Watershed, where, where we live and where we are doing restoration work. Uh, so the Gila water or the Gila River and its surrounding watershed starts in New Mexico and runs to the Colorado River through Arizona. Um, it was once in the past a wide, continually flowing river, uh, has been used by people for thousands of years. Um, and it currently supports a lot of agriculture. Um, sand straw, which is where Rabbit Farm is located, is part of the Gila watershed. Um, and here's a map uh, showing uh, where sand straw is. On the right we have uh, a map of Rabbit Farm's location, so you can see it's 
uh, just a little bit southeast of us. And so what uh, the plan is for this site is to restore some, uh, some surface water catchments and some natural wetlands. Uh, so we do restoration work um, here around the river because it has been threatened and degraded in the past. Um, oh, the climate change is a big problem right now. Uh, the, the years have been hotter and drier and this has impacted the river uh, and the plants around it at restoration sites. Uh, hotness and dryness really affects uh, the plants that we put out there. Um, a lot of them just don't survive be uh, because they can't get enough water or get fried up. Uh, groundwater level has been a big problem um, because of the large-scale agriculture in the area uh, that uses a lot of water and that um, affects how plants can get their water, obviously. Um, land use changes, this is specific for this rabbit farm site. Uh, this site used to be uh, fed by surface water coming from the Whitlock Mountains and it has, that surface water has since been diverted uh, to use uh, for agriculture. So after, after we identify a restoration site, um, we go on to establish goals for a site. We do this with uh, the history of a site and how it's looked in the past and how it will look in the future. Uh, there are a lot of targets that you can use. These are just a few, biodiversity enhancement, wildlife habitat, and erosion control. And I think that these are the most specific to the rabbit farm site. Um, berms and uh, places for water to flow uh, will be constructed and that should help with erosion control. And the wetlands that are going to be restored in that area will certainly provide a wildlife habitat uh, for birds especially. That is the target wetland birds. And it'll just in general enhance biodiversity. Um, so there, there are a lot of problems that can be encountered during restoration. This one I wasn't really aware of until I started working here, though it might seem obvious now, um, is the supply of plants. We're putting plants out into the environment and we got to get them from somewhere. Often these native plants are not commercially available and so they have to be grown and that's why uh, GWP works really well as a nursery that can grow native plants and then go out and put them into restoration sites. Um, these plants though have to be grown from cuttings or seeds and those have to be collected uh, from the outside and that is often a problem because uh, where you get these seeds or cuttings um, are owned by different private or federal or state landholders, and you have to have permits or permission to get um, to get to take stuff from that land. So it's the, there's a little bit of navigation there. Um, water is a big problem, obviously. Um, restoration sites that have plants um, need to be watered usually, as well as on the nursery, the plants that we grow here that go out for restoration need to be watered um, in the hot days or in the hot months almost every day or every day. Um, and that was a big part of our job uh, during the hotter times. We were watering a lot, uh, both at GWP field sites and at the nursery. Uh, and I'll just wrap this up with a little bit of the stuff I've done during this internship. Uh, we've done everything with seeds pretty much. We've collected them, we've cleaned them, we've sowed them. Uh, we've gone out to GWP field sites for restoration and looked at survival of plants as well as uh, just upkeep on restoration sites. Uh, we do a lot around the greenhouse uh, to keep everything running, keep all the plants out here alive and well. And yeah, I've had a, a very good experience so far. I think we all have. And now I'll toss it over to Emily East. She'll be talking about pollinators. Thank you, Trent. Hello. 
I will be talking about pollinators. My name is Emily East. Actually, before I get to talk about that, I have to talk about myself. Yay. Yeah, I was born in Safford. I graduated from Thatcher High School, and I finished three semesters at Eastern Arizona College. I've worked with GWP in the past, and I am interested in firefighting. So, what is a pollinator and what do they do? A pollinator is a bird, animal, or insect that unintentionally moves pollen from one flower to another while they're getting a sip of that sweet, sweet nectar. So, why do we need pollinators? Well, if a plant never receives proper pollination, then their seeds won't form. This will lead to the plant being endangered and possibly extinct if it never gets the pollination it needs to make its seeds. And as people, we need this a lot, um, mostly for cultivation and crops. The US Forest Service estimated that 80% of the worldwide population of pollinating flowers, sorry, 80% of the world's plants need pollinated to reproduce. Working with GWP and BLM has let me see a lot of the pollinators around the, um, the desert region. In the summers, our greenhouses and shade houses are bursting with all different kinds of pollinators just flying around and doing their own business. Most people think of bees when they hear the word pollinators. This might be because there are over 20,000 species of bees. And the ones who do do pollinating take responsibility for 80% of the cultivated crops around the world. But this still is only a small part of the pollinators that there are. There are hundreds of different species of butterflies, moths, wasps, flies, and hummingbirds that carry pollen around flowers. And in the case of the soap tree yucca or the blue agave, this transaction is very specific. There are certain pollinators that will only feed on these guys, and this is very crucial because in the um, BLM sites such as Rabbit Farm, these are the plants that are very prom prominent. And yes, the pollinators will, will very specifically favor these plants, such as how the long-nosed bat likes the agave flowers, while the yucca moth has the symbiotic relationship with the soap tree yucca laying its eggs in the seeds and having their babies feed on them to continue to spread the, the pollen of the, of the yucca. And the diversity of pollinators is wild. I've gotten to see so many new bugs and creatures around here, such as our triantula wasp, who has the most painful sting in all of North America and our sphinx moth, who has the longest tongue of all the butterflies or moth pollinators. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. And here is Anthony. Okay, how's it going everybody? So first thing I'd like to say is that Unlike these two, I didn't get to go to Rabbit Farm because I started later. So my presentation is gonna be about an experiment I decided to do for Rabbit Farm and hopefully it could help it. So my name is Anthony Hopkins Jr. I'm from San Carlos, Arizona, and I graduated from San Carlos High School. I'm an intern at GWP and I'm interested in becoming a mechanic or coming a firefighter, because I've done both of those already, and it's fun. So about two months ago, Kara put um, 
like six bags in front of us and told us to pick a seed. So I, the seed I picked is the one that I ended up doing the experiment for. And I had to get 98 seeds from each batch, clean and semi-clean. And I had to plant them and see which one would grow better. And this is the plant I chose, the green sprangle top. Scientific name is Leptocoa dubia. And it ranges from one to three feet, six to 18 inches long for the leaf blade. And it does really good in droughts. It won't die out. And it's short lived, but it, it um, germinates pretty fast. It grows quick. And then you could put it in fertilizer and it'll, it'll keep the weeds down and have other plants grow easier. And these are the conditions that help the plant grow healthy. And the comments below are just stuff I looked up and decided to put in there. So I'm just gonna go by that. And that picture right there you're looking at is where you can find these plants in the Southwest. The distribution on top, it does go all the way across the Southern United States but I decided to choose this just because it's in the Southwest. And the rabbit farm is somewhere in the low left center, somewhere around there. And it's best grown in open plateaus, hills, alluvial areas, and dry open spaces. So setting up my experiment, like I said before, I had to clean two, two batches, each batch, I'm sorry that it says 100 batch, 100 seeds on the PowerPoint. It was supposed to say 98. I messed that up. And I will have to find out what would germinate better out of those two batches. So I have to sow, water, and plant them and watch them, watch over them. So October 13th was when I planted them. And every other day since then, I've been checking on them. And I didn't really know what was going to happen. I want to see what would grow faster. That's why I wanted to do this experiment. And these are the results of what happened. The right side is clean, the fully clean seed. And it says 11 right there, but I checked just earlier and there was two new ones that just came out. So that makes it 13. And the left side is the semi-clean. Only four grew out. I checked earlier and it's still just four. And they're a lot smaller than the fully clean ones. For some reason, the, the fully clean grew a lot taller and a little bit faster. So that's the end of my presentation. It says 11, right? Um, it says 15 in total on there, but I just checked earlier and now it's 17. And what I like to say is cleaning this seed, it may help germination i don't really know but hopefully we can find that out soon thank you and here's carol all right so if you guys want to come around and maybe let's see if we have all right thank you everybody that was great um i'm going to stop the share here um and do we have any questions doesn't look like we have any questions yet. Um, since there's just a couple on, I think if you all, do you all have any questions for the, um, for the interns? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, have you guys found any Chihuahua scurf peas over at Rabbit Farm this year? So they um, did not, I, I can answer that. They, um, Anthony did not get a chance to visit Rabbit Farm. Emily and Trent did, um, but we did not have the pleasure of looking for scurf peas. I've heard that they're around there. That's an endangered species. Yeah, and, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, but yeah, unfortunately they didn't get to do that this time. Okay. When we were there, um, what was his name, Johnny? She did mention Chihuahua scurf pea. It was not at Rabbit Farm, but it was in a site um, near there. Mm. So we didn't. We did not get to see the. We did not get to see the scurf pea. 
Sure. Thank you, guys. So Melanie would like to know what was each of your favorite parts of the internship. So I'm going to step away and let you all take a take a stab at, at telling her. My favorite part of the internship was being back with GWP. I love you guys. This has been great. Yeah, I mean, I'd say my favorite part of the uh, this internship has definitely been the work environment. It's been wonderful. Um, I find the I find the work that we do really fulfilling. Uh, yeah, I just think I just think it's a great place to work, and it's a great experience that I've had. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm just gonna stand up. Um, the thing I liked about most is learn about new plants and how they grow, the way they live, and learning how to. What do you call that again? Cleat scene. That was that was pretty cool. I like doing that. All right. Any other questions? I'm gonna try to stay. Oh no, we're all out of them. <laughs> all right. Any other questions from anybody? Oh, Melanie has another one. How oh. has this contributed to your future career career plans? Yeah. All right. So I'll get out of the way again. <laughs> Maybe you could all, if you all want to try to get yeah. in the, yes. in the view. Uh, I mean, for me, I think this is sort of solidified the path I want to go on. Uh, I started this job because I thought it would be something that I might be interested in and I was correct. And so I guess I'll have that to go on in the future. <laughs> I'll think about grad school eventually, maybe. Um, and do something that can direct me towards doing more of this stuff. All right, no. okay. All right, so what was the question again? How has this contributed to your future career plan? To me, uh, I honestly do not know because with forestry, I'm basically a firefighter and I'll be out in the mountains and being a mechanic, you're just working on vehicles and industrial type of machinery. So I don't really know how this helps, but I really enjoyed it and I liked it. And I was just always interested in plants. So I like this the most. I guess for me, um, this has been the most enjoyable work I've ever done. So, just being out like with the plants and being able to take care of things, it's, I don't know, I don't think I can do like any kind of desk job or anything else knowing that, that this is a thing. Is any other questions popping up? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you all so much for being here. And um, again, this is recorded. So if anybody, if you know of anybody who'd like to see this, please pass it on um, or let me know and I'll pass it on. And have a great afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> Is that that? Is that